welcome the audience and Susan Cowley to this episode of the podcast that is titled On an Invisible Illness for Professional Musicians. Hi, Susan. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Thanks for having me. Um, before we start the discussion on this um, uh, um, um, topic, uh, let me introduce you. Dr. Susan Cowley currently serves as the instructor of clarinet at the University of Nebraska at Omaha and instructor of woodwinds at Hastings College and a principal clarinetist with the Hastings Symphony Orchestra. Cowley currently serves on the International Clarinet Association's Health and Wellness Committee and is a member of the artistic leadership team for the Clarinet Fest 2025. She has been invited to perform at the International Clarinet Association's Clarinet Fest conferences and New Music Weekend, the College Music Society Regional and National Conferences, and the National Association for College Wind and Percussion Instructors National Conferences. As a soloist and with uh, her trio, the Pianissimo Trio, an advocate of music by living composers, Cowley has commissioned and premiered works by composers such as Eric Mandat and Krista Vasquez Connelly. Recent awards as a soloist include the first prize for the 2023 Charleston International 20th Century Music Competition and the third prize for the 2021 Charleston International Contemporary Music Competition. So, season, welcome you to this episode. Thank you. Uh, I think you'd like to say a few words um, as a disclaimer before we start the discussion. Yes, um, I just wanted to say that anything that I talk about is just kind of my own personal experiences and my thoughts about my experiences um, and that nothing I say is medical advice. Thank you very much. Um, while we had this, um, you're a professional clarinetist. Um, you've been uh, um, uh, playing the clarinet for, 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 for more than a decade. Um, so while we, you have this invisible illness that we'll talk about, uh, you have successfully managed to, to work around, to work with, and, and, and to overcome and really um, do your best, whether it's uh, teaching, it's performing, it's practicing, or, or chamber music or anything else. So you can function as, as a, a perfect um, a clarinetist, chamber musician, orchestra player, and, and teacher. So um, what is this invisible illness that you have? Um, so I have an autoimmune disease called Addison's disease. Um, and that means that my immune system uh, basically killed off my adrenal cortex, which makes a whole bunch of things, but the most importantly, cortisol and um, aldosterone. Um, so cortisol is widely known as the stress hormone. Um, and it's one of the major things that kind of helps your body run, um, because everything in itself is kind of a stressor. Um, and the other thing that's important is aldosterone, which helps to balance your, um, electrolyte levels, specifically, um, sodium and potassium. And so, um, I have to take medications to kind of help keep all of that in check. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, my next question would be <clears throat> that when were you diagnosed with this disease and uh, what was the way to the diagnosis? Did it happen suddenly, instantly, or um, people, um, medical professionals, they needed to figure this out? So I was diagnosed the summer after I graduated um, from my master's. Um, and I had been experiencing symptoms from as far back as like high school. Um, but it didn't really get severe until, um, really the last year of my master's. Um, and you know, I, because a lot of the symptoms I was experiencing were so vague, 
Um, a lot of the doctors I had seen had kind of brushed me off and just told me that it was getting older. <laughs> um, and so by the time it got really serious, I, you know, didn't really think that it was anything worth going to the doctor for. And, um, thankfully I did at the, uh, urging of, you know, some of my close friends, but, um, I was diagnosed pretty quickly once I went to the doctor and then I kind of realized how serious everything really was. Interesting. Um, you mentioned that uh, you needed some time to really uh, get the courage to go to the doctors uh, by peers, uh, not peer pressure, but uh, advice, um, which is, um, I think, some of the... Um, um, ways that we get advice uh, might not come from professor or might not come from medical uh, professional, but some of the people that just listen to you. Um, where did the symptoms start to appear in your life? Um, looking back, uh, it started as early as like 15 or 16 years old. Um, but some of the more noticeable symptoms really started when I was an undergrad. Um, I remember I started to just feel really tired all the time. Um, and by the time I was in my master's, um, I was at the point where I was drinking at least a pot of coffee a day. <laughs> I was still exhausted. Not knowing why you yeah. had that exhaustion. Yep. And what what else happened besides that you felt tired very easily and, and exhausted? Yeah. Um, so um, one of the other things I struggled with was uh, my blood pressure, um, just because of the really low sodium levels I had unknowingly. Um, and there was one rehearsal in particular in my undergrad that I remember. Um, I couldn't even play it because every time I tried to blow into my instrument, I would almost pass out. And I thought maybe I didn't drink enough water that day or it was, you know, something um, just kind of not anything to think about. Um, but once I was into my master's, especially into the second year, um, I started to experience that sort of thing, not necessarily like to the same level, um, but I experienced some lightheadedness when I would play my instrument every single day the second year of my master's. Um, and that um, got even worse as the school year went on. And, um, you know, after I graduated, it got to the point where I couldn't even blow into my instrument without blacking out. Um. Now, when the doctors um, discovered um, the root of the problem and they labeled it as Edison disease, uh, what was the way to either recovery fully or uh, partial, depending on uh, how you feel uh, yourself? Yeah, so um, it took uh, the better part of a year for me to kind of figure things out and experimenting with um, some of the medications I was taking. Um, but for a good solid like eight months, uh, I really, really struggled. And I wondered if I would ever actually be able to play the clarinet again, because I just could not get it under control to the point where I could play my instrument without having issues with my blood pressure. Um, but uh, I found something that works really well for me, and it's something that I've really kind of stuck with ever since then. Um, so what do you have to do on a daily or weekly or, or monthly basis the doctors prescribed for you? Um, so for me, it's really just kind of taking my, you know, set corticosteroids and other things on a pretty strict schedule. Um, and, uh, because I basically have a set level of cortisol that I have in my body every day, I have to be really conscientious of, um, my stress levels and how much I'm exerting myself or if I'm sick, because then, um, 
if I'm experiencing symptoms of low cortisol, I have to make sure that I take extra. Um, so it's something that's just kind of like always in the back of my mind a little bit that I'm always kind of checking in with myself. It must be very religiously kept and, and be really mindful every day of the next coming uh, day or week. Um, um, what um, my next question relate to um, that uh, what are some of the things that you found to be very beneficial that you do, let's say if you have a regimen, a daily regimen, what are those things that really help you um, keep at bay, keep the Addison disease at bay, even though you are taking a, a steroid injection every, um, every day, what are some of the things that you built for yourself that are beneficial, whether it's mental, physical, or, or, or emotional, spiritual? Um, so, uh, because my a hundred percent is a lot different than everyone else's. Um, I work really hard to, um, really prioritize my health, especially, um, in the times when I'm not as busy. So for me, that's making sure that I'm waking up at the same time every day, um, I don't always get to go to bed at the same time, but for me, that waking up at the same time is super key because I'm in charge of my circadian rhythm um, because your cortisol levels and how they rise and fall throughout the day really kind of dictates your circadian rhythm. And so making sure that I um, take everything at the exact same time every day um, and um, you know, other things that I do are um, meditation and um, making sure that I'm getting in daily movement. Um, lately, it's been more walking and, um, you know, strength training because running tends to run me down just a little bit too much. Um, and it's really not something that I feel like I can genuinely push unless it's during the summer when I'm a little less busy. Um, but I just try to do anything I can to manage my stress levels and um, kind of stay at a good base level. Okay. So when we talk about stress, um, we don't only talk about mental stress, right? So we talk about physical stress that we, my body might, might exert. Uh, you mentioned running. Um, it affects that level as well. Um, is there is there any other stress level besides, let's say, a performance or a very busy schedule or anything else that might in a, um, um, negatively affect uh, your professional life and that you have to be really looking out for? Yeah. So um, for me, especially since I'm early in my career, I do a lot of driving with the adjunct teaching I do. Um, and that is uh, a lot bigger of a stressor on my body than I uh, thought it would be. Um, and so sometimes it's been kind of difficult to deal with. Um, I just got done with an extra busy past couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, it. I can usually like deal with it um, when I'm in the thick of it. But usually towards the end is kind of when... Uh, I start to notice the effects of if I push myself too much. Um, and I went to campus um, this past week a little early before I had to teach to warm up. And I um, could not even play like four beats into um, my long tones on low E without almost passing out. And it took me like two hours to get my blood pressure back up. And that was a really frustrating moment um, just because, uh, you know, sometimes it sucks to just not have control over how your body reacts to certain situations. Especially if you have a performance same night. <laughs> so yes, yes. What, what, what did you do um, that really affected, you know, you coming back um, into regular rehearsal routine after you notice that you can't even play a couple of measures. 
Um, what well, what are some of the strategies that really worked for you in that moment? So for me, um, it just has a lot to do with my blood pressure in particular has to do with my um, electrolyte balance. And if I am kind of undershooting things with my meds by accident, <laughs> um, that's kind of when my blood pressure will suffer. And so I have to go find something to eat that's salty. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I had to go and find something to eat, uh, and I took some extra meds and that helped like, you know, 10%. And then I found something else that was saltier and that did yeah. the trick. So obviously you have a strategy of what to do in certain situations. How long did it take for you to arrive to those strategies? Um, it's been just kind of a lot of trial and error. Um, so I have found that like, uh, on my especially long teaching days, I actually have to take an extra little dose of medication, um, that I don't normally take. Um, so it's really just kind of been learning what some of my low cortisol symptoms look like and just, you know, having the self-awareness to realize in the moment oh, hey, I need to, you know, do this so that I don't, um, you know, put myself in a hole later with how I'm feeling. Yeah. Um, how did the Edison disease um, affect your uh, professional regimen, such as, and I'm talking mostly about practicing, because we as professional um, um, instrumentalists, we have to practice hours a day, um, is there anything chunking up um, uh, or a different approach to um, a practicing that might help um, others also dealing with the same problem, the experience? What, what's, what are some of the advice that you can give people? Um, so for me, I, um, I really don't necessarily have issues unless I'm not managing my Addison's, Addison's disease super well. Um, but, um, I just make sure that I take lots of breaks <laughs> that I'm not, um, you know, pushing myself too hard or, you know, doing things that I know that, um, will make me stressed. Like if I'm trying to work on something that's extra stressful or difficult, sometimes I'll have to, you know, take a breather because I know that it will, um, you know, make me um, need to take more medicine, basically. Absolutely, absolutely. You mentioned that um, when you had this uh, episode, um, one of the day that you actually um, um, took something salty, so um, the, the level in the blood would rise up again. Which one does drink or food work better when we're talking about? replenishing some of the levels in the blood for you personally yeah for me um usually food will do the trick um but you know making sure that i'm drinking electrolyte water or just like uh drinking and eating enough food just kind of in general um that um really helps me especially when I'm stressed. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, what are some of the other ways that Edison disease really changed your life besides let's say you mentioned meditation. You know, it's not necessarily part of a professional regimen. What are some of the other ways that you can you can tell that changed and and for the better? Let's say that. Um I definitely think that it makes makes me more conscientious of um, prioritizing self-care, um, especially, you know, in working with my students. I'm always trying to make sure that they're taking care of themselves because that's something that's really, really important to me. Um, and so I always try to incorporate that into my own teaching. Interesting. Isn't it interesting that once you go through that, you you are made aware 
<laughs> by by yourself, by your own body and, and mind. And really um, that awareness translates to you know you dealing with other people. And just be more more aware, more compassionate. Um, what are some of the advice you can you can um, give to professors, teachers, students, um, or just avid um, uh, musicians, clarinetists, uh, uh, um, performing artists? Yeah. Right. So um, I guess um, my big thing is just kind of understanding that you know, not everyone um, has the same sort of abilities. So, you know, technically I'm disabled um, and that has a lot of implications for me. Um, so like I can't uh, apply for any job in the military. So, you know, for other people in the same sort of situation as me, it's a whole line of work that is effectively eliminated from me. Um, and, you know, there are um, physical limitations that come with that as well. And I think making sure that you keep those things in mind is important. I've certainly had to um, turn down um, opportunities for the sake of my own um, well-being. And it kind of sucks sometimes, but, um, you know. Um, I think in the long run, that's a smart and wise thing to do. You don't want to burn yeah. yourself out and then not being able to play for, for a week or maybe a couple of days. Right. And then I know for me, I don't always like to talk about the fact that I, I do have a disability because I don't necessarily want sympathy from people. Um, and I don't want to be treated differently either. And I'm sure other people feel similarly as I do. Um, and a lot of people, um, you know, they don't really understand. Uh, disability has a lot of like negative associations with it. And um, I know for me, uh, as someone with an invisible illness, people can't see what's wrong with me. And so they just see me going along and doing everything that I do and think that, um, you know, oh, she's just, you know, able to do everything just fine. How bad could it possibly be um, when they, you know, can't see how I'm feeling and some of the aftermath of um, what I'm experiencing. Um, and I think having some compassion <laughs> for students that uh, in particular, the deal with that is really important um, because they're also learning how to deal with those emotions, being an adult, because it's not easy. Um, you know, um, I sometimes feel like I'm not disabled enough to consider myself disabled. Um, and so those feelings can be kind of challenging to deal with. Um, and the other side of it too is, you know, uh, with autoimmune diseases, a lot of times we're called spoonies, um, because we have a set amount of spoons to give to different things. Um, and, you know, for me, I, um, I try to not let, uh, my hand of cards impact what, uh, I want to do for my career. And so for me, that means I give all of my spoons to my career and the clarinet, and I don't necessarily always leave any for me. Um, and I'm sure that there are other people that are in similar situations because really, um, you know, uh, the, um, the field of music doesn't necessarily care if you're disabled. They just, you know, expect you to do the things um, because ultimately, you know, it, it is a job and it has to get done. Thank you. But I think that is the reason also why it is so important to show that someone has a disability uh, to advocate for themselves as well as to make, make others aware of that hey, there's something that we need to work with. So 
hiding is absolutely not a good strategy <laughs> in that case because um, uh, we are not we are we, we are we are posing different expectation to uh, towards others uh, or for others towards us that might not you know conduce say um, a fluent working relationship. So I think it's good if uh, employer uh, colleagues know that we have that disability, even though it might be. Um, you might you might feel we might feel stigmatic stig stigmatized by it. Um, I can um, um, really um, see that that feeling. Um, uh, another question I wanted to ask you: You mentioned the self care and <clears throat> how important that is to you on a daily basis. Um, would you like to share a couple of um, words about the self-care challenge that uh, um, you put out through the Health and Wellness Committee for the month, um, for the mo uh, month of uh, March uh, as a 30-day health, health, ch health care challenge? Yes, of course. Um, so I put together a 30-day challenge that really is impossible to fail. Um, it's really just kind of... Um, uh, dedicating yourself to 30 days of doing the best you can at prioritizing your own well-being. Um, and there's a different prompt for every single week. And um, there is a coloring page that I drew for um, each week in March as well. Um, and you can check all of that stuff out on the ICA social media pages. There's a calendar, um, and we hope that you, you know, share some of your experiences with the prompts for that. Absolutely. So anyone can post um, um, a photo, a video of them uh, taking care of themselves uh, through the healthcare challenge. Um, there's a, a very nice provided calendar today. The challenge is to get a little bit outside in the nature, either walk or just see the nature alone or with family. And so I've already done it and I, I enjoy really being in nature. Um, Susan, is there anything else you would like to say as a concluding thought that you might not have said or it popped into your mind recently? Um, the only Don't. thing I would say is that you know, if you're going through similar experiences, you know, it is hard um, and you are definitely not alone. Um, anyone really can become disabled at any point in their life, whether it's temporary or permanent, um, and it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan, for accepting the invitation and sharing this very personal um, experience with us uh, and with the audience. So we're grateful for that. Thank you so much.